Brett Okamoto does a great job covering the MMA for ESPN. Joins us for a couple moments to talk a little McGregor and Diaz, too. See if he's uh, excited about this one. I know there's been a lot of uh, fanfare surrounding this. A lot of uh, MMA fans don't want to see it. Some want to see it. But, uh, Brett, first and foremost, appreciate a couple moments. How are you, Ben? I'm doing well, man, of course. Thanks for having me on. Well, we appreciate it. And I'll tell you, you know, it's it's interesting, too, because any time you get an opportunity for rematches, uh, I think people look at how the first fight or the fight transpired. And I look at this, look, it's going to be at 170. I'm not going to say it's a no-brainer. I know there's a lot of pros and cons to this rematch, but I think, in my estimation, look, McGregor, he's earned the right to handpick his opponent. I don't care what anyone says. I mean, you might agree, you might disagree. The revenue, what he's bringing to the sport, the titles, the the the, the flair. Uh, he's a braggadocious character. He's a loudmouth, borderline obnoxious, but he's a heck of a talent. And at the end of the day, that sells. I mean, what's your thoughts on this and the rematch right now going forward? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about with the rematch. You could get into all kinds of angles with it. But what you said about him earning the right to handpick his opponent, I, I couldn't agree more, especially in this circumstance, because the first time these two guys fought was on 11 days' notice. You know, Conor McGregor was trying to take a shot at history. He was originally supposed to fight the lightweight UFC champion, Rafael Dos Anjos, and Dos Anjos pulled out with a broken foot. And yeah. most guys in this sport, if they would have been Conor McGregor, would have been like, well, all right, I'm going to pull off the card as well. They wouldn't fight a completely different opponent on 11 days' notice, especially when they're a champion. Conor McGregor is, is such a, a famous athlete at this point. They just don't take those kinds of risks. Like, I'm going to lose to a guy who was coming in on 11 days' notice. That would look terrible upon me. I'm just going to wait. I'll wait for my shot at, at Dos Anjos when he's healthy. Conor McGregor didn't do that, and, and that's what makes him so exciting and what makes him – uh, such a fan favorite is that he's not going to pull off the card. He's going to fight somebody like a Nate Diaz. And I think he learned that night that there's a difference between fighting at 145 pounds and fighting the guy that weighs 170 pounds. And, and that ha did have an effect on the fight. And so now he's he's getting an opportunity to go in with that knowledge and, and get that, that shot at, at redeeming his that loss, I guess. So I have no problem with him asking for the rematch, and I really don't have much of a problem with the UFC giving it to him. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point as well. When you talk about rematches, I always look at how the first fight ended. And people, again, they go by face value. We're in this social media age where someone might see a highlight and right away draw their own conclusion. This was not a one-sided fight. It, it was, and I think, you know, Connor comes out, he dominates the first round, he was catching Diaz with the left, and then Diaz, to his credit, weathers the storm after that first round to pull off the win. So to me, I, I still think there's a uh, there's something to be said in that regard. If this was uh, if this was a, a quick tap out, a, a quick submission, uh, a quick knockout, just like in boxing, if it's a first round or a second round, or maybe you're like, man, you know what, uh, these guys go at it again. Uh, it, it's going to be the same result. But I think in that regard, uh, that's something that McGregor can kind of take and, and, and learn from what to do and what not to do. So I do think it makes a rematch more appealing, especially for UFC fans. Yeah, I, I see the same thing. You know, the Connors. Conor McGregor's jiu-jitsu is terrible. You know, he went in there and he, he took a lame shot and he got choked out by Nate Diaz. Well, he got choked out in the second round after Nate had already boxed him up on the feet. I mean, the whole the whole point of him shooting that, that awful takedown was because, you know, he was hurt and, and he was basically out on his feet. And, and that was after at a point where he was very tired that he had hit Nate Diaz with a lot of shots. He had put a lot into the left hand. You know, I think that Conor recognized very early on in the fight that the left hand is a big weapon for me. It keeps landing. Um, and so he went to that well a lot. You know, Nate Diaz, as good as he looked in that fight, I mean, Nate Diaz is not a perfect fighter. Right. If you go back and look at the course of his career, I mean, this guy's never held a world championship. He's a very good fighter. He's fought for a UFC title before. But let's not all of a sudden say that this guy is completely unbeatable. I, I mean, Connor has weaknesses that he can exploit of Nate Diaz that he really didn't in the first fight because he fell in love with the left hand. So I'm not saying that that, that means that Conor McGregor is going to go in there and, 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 and take him out early and easily this time, but I'm just saying, yeah, I agree with you. I think a lot of people are, are hung up on what happened in that second round when Nate Diaz started to take over and they're completely dismissing what happened in the first six minutes of the fight. Now you talk about fighters that really deserve shots at the titles and you look at a guy uh, like Frankie Edgar who I think is, again, you, you talk about one of those great athletes and and, and a great all-around fighter. I look at Frank Yeager, and, and how about this? You know, the fact that he's going to take on 
Aldo, and call it what it is. If you want to call it an interim featherweight title, that's fine. I mean, the winner is, quote, expected to face McGregor later in the year when the belts are unified. Um, to me, I think this was it, it is a fight as a number one contender, perhaps, uh, for the winner. But ultimately, what does it say? Is this more of an indictment on just the politics within the UFC or of a guy of Edgar who's still not getting his just due or respect that he's kind of on the outside looking in again? I, mean, I think it's a combination of all of it. You've got you've got fighters who are willing to trash talk, and they get certain opportunities. And then you have other fighters who let their performances speak for themselves. And unfortunately, this sport is based around tickets you can sell and pay per views that you can sell. So sometimes those guys get overlooked a little bit. And Frankie Edgar is a guy who has been given millions of opportunities to trash talk, and he doesn't do it. And and that's that's a credit to him. I mean, he's he's basically stayed true to himself and true to his values, and that's just not something that he's interested in. But that also means that he's not always the first guy that the UFC is looking towards, you know, when they're looking to build a massive event at UFC 200. So I think that that hurts Frankie Edgar in a sense, but it's also just because of how unique Conor McGregor is. I mean, you just don't see champions win a title and then automatically move up a a weight class and, and, and be calling all these shots, you know, and that's just because we haven't really seen somebody like, like McGregor, who first of all is willing to do that. And second of all, just has the leverage to say, I, I want this fight, and the UFC kind of has to go along with it. So I think there's a lot of things at play here. It's just bad timing, in a sense, by, by Frankie Edgar, because he is very deserving, but you look at what's going on, and you can kind of say, like, all right, I can understand why this is happening to him. Yeah, it's, it's not great for him, and it's probably unfair, but it's not like the UFC is, has something against him. It's just kind of the circumstances that he's dealing with. Uh, Brett, last one for you, and appreciate a couple moments uh, on this Friday. When you look at John Jones, I mean, again, it, it's just, to me, it, it's just after a while, it's just flat-out nonsense. I mean, you talk about a guy walking a fine line. Uh, I look at him, for, forget about the fighter, but the, just the person himself. I mean, w- what happens if he goes back to probation court? We're, we're talking six months into his 18-month suspension agreement, and what is it, two, three separate citations, driving without a uh, uh, a license, without insurance, cited for drag racing. I know Dana White is excited to get him back in the octagon, but at what point do you just say, you know what, we might have to suspend this guy, uh, you know, contract uh, conduct detrimental. I know boxing and MMA is totally different in that regard, but is he ever going to get it? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if he's ever going to get it. I think it, it depends on what, on how you describe or, or you know define what does it mean to get it. I mean, the guy has uh, clearly should not be driving at this point. I mean, you, you look at, at at all of the different issues that he's had, and they have all stemmed basically from him being behind the wheel and. I mean, someone has to step up around John Jones and say, "Look, man, get a mover." Whether you, whether you ever <laughs> asked to be John Jones or not, right. you are John Jones. I mean, you are a high-profile, best fighter in the world. People are paying attention to you now. Like, I'm sorry, man. I know that you like your freedom and you like sure. to drive your car or whatever, but we have got to fix this. I mean, you have to get a driver. I mean, let's pay somebody to sit in your garage and drive you around wherever, <laughs> whenever you want to leave. I, I mean, that's. Because basically what's happening now is I do think that, that John is being required to be perfect. I mean, is driving without a license and proof of insurance a big deal? Does it mean that he should be sitting in jail? No. Just sitting at a, at a red light, and, you know, we don't know exactly what happened because there's no video of was he drag racing, did he just rev up his engine, whatever. Let's take him for his word for it, even if we want to take his word for it. Let's say he just revved up his engine. You're in a fast car. People know who you are in that town. I mean, you just you have to be perfect, and it doesn't look like he's really necessarily capable of being perfect. So it, it's created a weird situation in that, like, maybe he has gotten it. You know, maybe he's doing things a lot better in his personal life, but there's still just that little piece of him that can't be all the way 100% perfect. And unfortunately, that might cost him because when you're on a probation and everybody's eyes are on you, you, you have to live up to a different standard. And, and so far, John has not really given us a lot of confidence that he's capable of doing that. So we'll see. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, Uber's a call away. It's a quick call. It's a quick phone call. They'll it's take not even care. a call. It's a little tap on your phone. <laughs> that's, well, that's true. It's an app now, so they'll take care of all your driving needs. <laughs> Shameless plug to them. Hey, Brett, uh, great stuff. I appreciate you jumping on board. Hopefully, we'll get you back on and uh, talk a lot more MMA and, of course, UFC 200 right around the corner uh, in July. I appreciate a couple moments, my friend. Anytime, Rich.